Thank you so much, beloved brother and colleague Rabbi Ari Volby, backbone of the community in Texas and all Southwest and does so much. It's, it's, it's our honor to partner with Torch. It's a esteem, a deep honor for Hashem. And we welcome everybody with Hashem's loving grace to our Likotei Moran Shur. Uh, Rabbi Volby prefaced by saying that tonight already in Israel, the new day in the Jewish calendar starts after sundown. And it's already after sundown. So it's the first month of Adar. There's first month Adar and second month Adar, Adar Aleph and Adar Beit this year, and lunar calendar. Now, this exactly coincides with what we're learning tonight, Bezat Hashem. We're going to complete Torah 7, Likutei Moran, the first part. And Torah 7 talks about taking advice from a tzaddik. Well, maybe someone says, you know, that they think it sounds to people that read this, that Rabbi Nachman is this arrogant and he's advertising himself and you got to come to me. There's, who's the real tzaddik? The real tzaddik, well, it's Rabbi Nachman. Well, but Rabbi Nachman has to understand, he knows exactly who he is. Just like Moses, there was the greatest, most humble man on earth. Moses knew exactly what he is. Rabbi Nachman knew exactly what the Torah said about the knowledge that Moses got on Mount Sinai and passed it down. And we receive it all from a process of uh, rabbi to student, rabbi to student, rabbi to student in an unbroken chain from Mount Sinai. I could give you from student rabbi well, all the way up and go back that it's about 107 generations between me and Mount Sinai. But, but right back, it's unbroken chain. Unbroken chain, this is what this is what we're connected. What is this knowledge? First of all, let's see, last week, let's say last week we learned the importance of taking advice from the right person. Now, the right person is the tzaddik, or one of the tzaddik, if the tzaddik is not alive, then we just take his writings, and we take his disciples that continue in the path of that tzaddik, okay? So you have to take up advice to the right person, because if a person is not connected to truth, as we learn also in the Torah 7, then you're going to get the wrong advice, and it's not going to be advice from the light side, from the holy side. There's plenty of that. You have to understand what Newton said in physics, equal and opposite reaction. There's also in metaphysics that for everything that goes on on the holy side, there's a dark side also. Just like you have 10 spheres in couple, you have 10 spheres on the, on the holy side. There's 10 spheres on the dark side because you can't have in this world, we have a free choice. We are the only creations in the world that have the body of a mammal and the soul of an angel. Okay, our job in this world is to subjugate the body to the soul. Most people get it wrong. Most people have their soul subjugated to their body. That's why they're so far from Hashem and so far from spirituality. Okay, the tzaddik shows how to connect us. That's the advice he gives us. So it's how to connect us to Hashem and so how to uh, make our neshamas, make our souls override the body, that the body becomes subservient to the soul. The body should actually be butler to the soul. Okay, the body go and be the excuse your soul, and the soul is the master, and the body is the butler. People get it the other way around, and they they have the their soul serving their body. First, they decide what their bodily appetites are, and then they make this ersatz truth around it. That's not the way to do it. Okay, so in this week's lesson, we're going to learn that if a person wants advice that he or she could depend on, they need a connection to a tzaddik. And the tzaddik connects a person to truth. Now look at the upward strive. A person connects to a tzaddik. A tzaddik connects a person to truth. To once a person has truth, a person can learn emuna. And what Rabbi Nachman said in the first lesson in Torah 7, that the reason we don't have geula, the holy temple, and the full redemption is because we don't have emuna. Okay, so by here, like connecting to the tzaddik, then we get to truth. By truth, we get to emuna. And by Amuna, we get to Mashiach and Beit Migdash, and that, that's the that's the ball game. We just won the ball game. Okay, that's it. And that's that's Tikkun Olam. That's correction on earth. Everybody knows about Tikkun Olam, but you can't get the Tikkun Olam any other way. So we said, what's this at knowledge? People think about, oh, what is knowledge? And and again, with the Torah, it's not with no Torah doesn't have knowledge. Need good adversity. Let's check that out. Let's check that out. Give me a challenge. Go to wherever you'd like to go. If you're in the UK, go to Oxford or Cambridge, the faculty of, of physics, the faculty of, uh, of uh, astrophysics, go to MIT, 
again, physics, astrophysics, ask any one of the professor emeritus there with all their computers, not to look at the at a Jewish website on the, on the web, no. Okay, don't look. Okay, sir, I want you to compute a lunar calendar. Okay, but not like the way the Arabs do it. The Arabs have a lunar calendar that is only according to the new moon. And the new moon, it's not like the solar calendar. So what happens is every year Ramadan comes out at a different time of the year. Sometimes Ramadan comes out in the summer. Sometimes it comes out in the spring. Sometimes the fall, sometimes the winter because they don't know how to even the year out. So it comes out exactly according to the solar calendar. Now with us, we know Pesach always comes out in springtime and Rosh Hashanah always comes out in the fall. And Pesach, Pesach in the springtime and the beginning of the summer is always, always the same thing. And I say, compute a lunar calendar that can equal a Hebrew calendar. They'll ne never figure it out because this is the knowledge that Hashem gave to Moses and Moses gave to Joshua. Joshua gave to the elders. The elders gave to the prophets. The prophets gave to the sages of the mission. The mission says to the Gomorrah. And the Gomorrah gave to the first scholars. Then the first scholars came to the latter scholars. And latter scholars is right to our, our teachers of today. So what is it? Just stop and think. Okay, figure this out, uh, press Professor Emeritus. Uh, you know what you need to do? First, you need to start to make a 247-year cycle. This 247-year year cycle is connected of 13 cycles of 19 years each. Okay, of 19 years each. And within these 13 cycles of 19 years each, eight out of the 19 years have a leap month like this year. Okay, now you have to know exactly, not to the second, because it won't be accurate. The NASA knows to the second. NASA does not have an accurate, uh, accurate uh, th their calculation of the amount that the moon circles the, the, the earth is less accurate than Moses's. Moses is more accurate. What did Moses do? Moses learned from Hashem to take the hour and to break it up into 1,080 parts. That's called halakim. Okay. So now Moses gives us a calculation that the soul, the lunar calendar is 29 days, the cycle that it takes a new moon around the earth, 29 days, 20, 29 days, 12 hours, and 793 parts. That 793 parts of an hour that's split into 10,080. There are secrets within that and secrets and secrets and secrets. They, go, they can't figure it out. They can't figure it out. So now what the Arabs have to do, they ask us all the time when Ramadan is. So the Arabs, they want to kill all the Jews except for one. They have to keep one wise, one wise rabbi alive that knows the secret. It's called the lunar secret, the lunar secret of the cycle. He knows how to make the calendar so that he will be able to tell them uh, whether the Ramadan begins on Tuesday or Wednesday. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know. See, this is this is the knowledge that they get from the people think they don't know. But they say, why you don't have, don't need to advertise it because they they're busy. Moses. Moses, if he wanted Moses wanted to mess around with quantum mechanics, Moses didn't bother with quantum mechanics, and Moses didn't bother with uh, uh, computer systems. He could have could have done binary numbering. Moses was he was basking in Hashem's light. He's getting divine knowledge. Okay, divine knowledge. The same thing with the Arizal. Any one of the Baal Shem Tov, they could all know this. And take even the Melitzer Rebbe's grandfather, the Shatzer Zevi, the the the, the Shatzer Rov of London. He's buried in uh, right outside London. Most of his grandfather, he never learned a day in university. All learned from Torah and all learned from the Rambam. And he once went to a science fair, Germany, and he, he said, he saw this, this with these scientists from Heidelberg. He said that they made a two-tenths of a second mistake about the orbits around the sun. They went crazy. They double checked. No, it can't be. And they said, Rabiner, what do you university? Did they find these and they went to university. This is the knowledge of the tzaddik. This is what I want to profess, profess. We're not just talking about something. This is not parlor knowledge. We're talking about Kabbalistic terms and spheres. These are the secrets of creation. You know why we know these secrets of creation? Because we got it from the creator. That he, He's the creator. Okay. <laughs> he, he didn't get it. We've got the, the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, the professor in MIT or in Heidelberg or in Cambridge, they don't have the manufactured instructions. They're running after their own brains. And that is why you get all these new theories that never, never, never hold on, except for one. There's one theory in physics. The Gaon of Vilna, okay, his name and last name in English 
was Rabbi Eliel Kramer. Nobody, the Kramers are going to do this. There's a law in physics called Kramer's Law. That's never been disproven. Okay, they go on for one time that they're going just, but by the way, he wasn't, he didn't deal in, in uh, uh, secular intellectual disciplines per se, but it was by the way, while he's learning a Torah. For example, all the astronomy you want is in, in Tractate Rosh Hashanah and the, and the, and the Torah. Mm-hmm. We made an conversation. He made a, a law of physics. And law of physics, boom, that's it, because it came from the Torah. And the Torah is the Hashem's blueprint. So when you go to the tzaddik, wow, that's it. You get right honed on, and it's not always logical. If you're a student of mathematics or physics, and somebody says, take the hour and break it into 1,080 parts, what is No. Hour is, is 60 minutes, is 60 minutes, 60 seconds. Hour will break it into 3,600. Okay, now what can you do with your 3,600? You've got your nice, neat lunar calendar and your nice, neat four-year cycle and your nice, neat uh, 29th of February every fourth year. Okay, what do you do? How do you do it with the lunar calendar? And the lunar calendar, why is it so important? Because there's a lot of laws in the Torah that affect the woman. The woman's physical cycle goes according to the lunar calendar. Her monthly cycle is exactly according to the moon. Just as the moon renews herself, look at the moon. The moon is a metaphor for a woman. Okay, the moon, you have a new moon and the moon wanes. And the new moon, and the same thing as a woman. She has a new moon and then it wanes and it comes out a new cycle, new moon and wanes. That, that, that's it. Exactly. You see, they could go on and on and on. But I just want to press to bring home what we're talking about when in Rebbe Nachman's teachings. We are getting teachings that Rebbe Nachman, Rebbe Nachman, he is considered the fifth in line from Moses, that there's the torch of Moses. Once again, the torch of Moses, what did Moses nuance? Moses brought down the written Torah from Mount Sinai. Moses passed the torch onto Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai. Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai, his nuance, that he brought down the esoteric Torah. Okay, that, that's we spent 13 years when the Romans were chasing him, said 13 years with a cave and his son. He's got these deep secrets from Hashem. Okay, and then he passed the baton on to the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi, who was the father of Kabbalah. He brought down the Torah of Kabbalah. And then where did he pass the baton on? The fourth was the Baal Shem Tov, and the Baal Shem Tov brought down the Torah of Hasidus. And the Baal Shem Tov he passed the baton on to his great grandson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. And Rabbi Nachman's nuance is the brought down the light of Amuna, the Torah of Amuna. And this is the Torah of Geula. And that's why Rabbi Nachman says in Yiddish, he has a Yiddish expression, my fire will burn until Mashiach. So from this we learn, Rabbi Nachman is indicating that this is the knowledge of Moses that we have until Mashiach comes. So what we're learning now, this is actually the knowledge of Moses. And this is what we started with. This this would be our our final lesson, Torah 7. We started by learning that the reason we don't have Mashiach yet is because of a lack of Amunah. So now Rabbi Nachman showed us in previous lessons how we arrive at Amunah. That we arrive at Amunah first, we have to connect to a tzaddik. And the tzaddik brings us to truth. Because we remember two lessons ago, we learned that Hashem's name is truth. Comes out that the truth is Hashem's name. If, the, if, if you take Hashem's name, the way he revealed it to Moses, and the numerical value comes exactly, I am that I am in Hebrew, ek yashel, yeah, the numerical value comes out exactly 441, and that's emet, that's truth. All these secrets in Torah. Okay, so then by getting to the truth, now we have the truth. What's it mean, the truth? The truth means that we put aside our preconceptions, we put aside our opinions, what is truth according to Hashem? Is this called stealing or is not stealing? Is this called murder or is it not murder? Is this adultery or not adultery? Okay, what is the truth? Not what I want to do. It's like a person throws a dart on a dartboard, but there's no bullseye. But then he takes a circle and draws a, a circle around the dart. He says, oh, see, I had the bullseye. Yeah, first he threw the dart, then he drew the, made the target. That's not the way to find truth. First, we decide what the target is. Now, let's find the bullseye. Okay, this is, so once we find truth, we find a Muna. Now that we have a Muna, we're Tikkun Olam, correction of the world. Okay, so now you can understand, this is what we do every Wednesday night with our Amuna Hour group. Learn, this is the, we try, try to correct ourselves. And by correcting ourselves, we, correct the, it, it, we influence the, the uh, surroundings and enough of us, we, we get on the, on the wagon and we'll change the world. 
We have to believe we have that power. Okay, so now open up your Likute Moran to the first part, Torah 7. We're now up to letter He. And in letter He, we have something very cryptic. Rabbi Nachman brings a segment of Gomorrah from Tractate Baba Basra, page 74. And there's portions in the Gomorrah that are more cryptic than Kabbalah, even though this is the Gomorrah. And these are the, the sagas of Rabba Barbarbatla. Rabba Barbarbatla, he was a student of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is the father of the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud. There's a, two sets of Talmud. One is the Babylonian Talmud that was in Babylon, and one is the Jerusalem Talmud, which was in land of Israel. The difference between the two is that the Babylonian Talmud doesn't address the laws pertaining to the land of Israel because they're already in exile. The Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, or called the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, addresses all the laws of the land of Israel, which most of the agricultural laws. For example, leaving a tithe in your field, uh, leaving part of the field fallow, uh, the sabbatical laws, leaving up the field every seventh year, uh, not, 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 not planting, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the laws that have to do with Eretz Yisrael. And for example, in, in land of Israel, uh, before you eat vegetables, you have to find out if they're kosher. There's this Kashka's books, they come out of the land of Israel. Have they had their tithe taken off? Uh, the fruit, uh, the fruit, uh, the fruit grown on a tree that's less than four years old is called Orla. We're not allowed to eat it. You know, it, it it's, it's, this is completely a different rhythm in the land of Israel. And that rhythm is brought down in the Jerusalem Talmud by the Holy Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Barbara Basra was, he and Reish Lakesh were the two prime disciples of Rabbi Yochanan. Reish Lakesh, he took the uh, ek, the exposed part of Torah, the open part of Torah, the legal part of Torah. Rabbi Baba Basra, he was a, a brilliant in the legal part of Torah, legal part of the Gemara, but he took the esoteric part, the very, very deep and esoteric part. So now we have one of his metaphors. Rabbi Baba Basra, he tells us, I'm going to say it in, in Hebrew, then I'll translate it. Um, Rabbi Baba, excuse me, Rabbi Baba Chana. Rabbi Baba Chana, so Rabbi Barbarchana tells us a story. Rabbi Barbarchana says this merchant came to me. Okay, we'll see there's there will see there's big secrets in every word that he says here. But first I translate the story. And the merchant said to him, it's a merchant like this Bedouin merchant in the desert. And he comes to Rabbi Barbarchana. He says, uh, come on, I'll show you Mount Sinai. So he says he went with this merchant and they went to see Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was encircled by these tremendous scorpions. That's tonight's lesson, Scorpio. That's what I call tonight's lesson, Scorpio. Tremendous scorpions. Okay. And Rabbi Barbarchana says, oh, these scorpions were so big, they looked like white mules. <laughs> they're, they're really white, like white donkeys. Okay, with the, the, the uh, discussion Aramaic, whether it's a, a, a mule or a donkey, each one has a different implication. But uh, let, let's say white mules. Okay, so he says, I heard a heavenly voice saying, Woe to me that I made an oath, but now that I've taken a oath, who can nullify it for me? He heard this voice out of, of the sevens as, as if the Almighty was saying, Oh, but I, I, the, the Almighty was I, the Almighty was giving remorse about an oath that he said at the destruction of the temple that he's going to send his children to exile. All right. So now let's look at deeper what he's talking about. So Rabbi Nachman says, okay, that when, when Rabbi Barbara says, the, 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 what does it mean when uh, the merchant said, come, I'm going to show you Mount Sinai, that this is an allusion to advice. Because Mount Sinai means Mount Sinai is synonymous to Torah. Whenever we say Torah me Sinai, we express that this is Torah me Sinai. When somebody with some absolute truth, for example, in uh, in okay, we have a different slang than secular Israelis. Okay, in uh, observant Torah observant community, that when somebody was telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you truth, he says this is Torah me Sinai. He said, this is this is Torah from Sinai. That means it's true. That's when somebody really wants to express that they're, they're giving you the full truth. So uh, the merchant says to Rabbi Barbachana, I, I want to show you, I want to show you Mount Sinai. So what does he mean 
He means I'm going to show you the Torah. And the Torah, as Rabbi Nachman told us in lesson three, that the Torah is 613 pieces of advice. The 613 commandments of Torah, they're called in Aramaic, Tayag Atin. Atin means a chunk of a morsel of advice. Okay, so Rabbi Nachman is not calling them commandments. He calling them a piece of advice because they're a piece of advice that Moses brought down from the heavens. Okay, this piece of this absolute truth. So anybody that follows a commandment of the Torah is going to be connected to truth. You have to do it, do it properly. So this is what we're talking about, that this is 613, that Moses brought down 613 pieces of advice from Mount Sinai. So what's it mean? It's encircled by scorpions. Okay, that the scorpions, Rabbi Nachman says advice of the serpent. Rabbi Nachman says scorpions advice of the snake. So wait a second, hold on. Rabbi Nachman, what are you, what are you talking about? Why does Rabbi Nachman change horses or change scorpions or change bugs, change critters? He goes from, from Scorpio to a snake. Well, this is also, Rabbi Nachman, he expects for us to know the whole Torah. That really, a person has to know the whole Torah to learn Likutei Mohan. And that's why it has to be so much explained. So Rabbi Nachman is switching horses. If you learn in the Zohar, Rabbi Shem Bayachai, that the evil inclination is male and female. The male side is a snake and the female side is a scorpion. So they're interchangeable. Okay, they're one unit. They're one unit. They're just like the evil inclination, husband and wife. Everything has a male side and a female side. And so there's no... Uh, the, the Torah is not chauvinistic at all. Everything's got a male side and a female side. Okay, so the male side of the evil inclination is the snake, and the female side is the scorpion, but they're interchangeable because they're one unit. So he's telling what it did. Here we have that Mount Sinai has got the 613 piece of advice, and now they're surrounded by 613 scorpions. Whoa, guess what? Uh, you've got the Derby in Manchester. Okay, you can't have a derby if only the Red Devils are on the on, on the field. You got to have city. Yeah, Manchester United, Manchester City. Same thing with the Super Bowl in the United States. You can't have the, you got to have the, the the Dallas Cowboys on the field. You got to have the New York Jets. And they, they have the opposition. And this is what it is here. Our whole challenge is to make the angel within us overcome the animal within us. All right, so that there's opposition on the field. So now it's not just he's go to Mount Sinai, learn my 613 pieces of advice from Moses and walk home into the sunset and become a big tzaddik. Uh-uh, there is, there's an enemy. There's 613 Nukba terrorists from Hamas ready right, to shoot you down for every mitzvah. That, that's, what, that's right here. So that is, they don't want us listening to the advice of the tzaddik. And that's why there's so much opposition to the tzaddik and even within the community there are people that against the Rebbe Nachman for for what what against so this is this is the way the eight sahara this way the eight sahara okay but now comes along Rebbe Nachman Rabbi Barbachana said wait a second they look like white mules what does he mean white mules okay white mules he says the white mules you can take the same power and take the same power of that evil inclination and you could turn it into holiness, do a spiritual Aikido on him. You take his momentum, turn it to holiness. So Rabbi Barbachana says, wait a second. I'm not going to lose hope. I'm not going to bother Bob for a Torah. They look like white mules. The white mules, what does he mean white mules? Rabbi Nachman says, I'm not going to go into the whole play of words and take about the whole uh, Bible Hebrew language. But the white mules that indicate the white strings of the tzitzit. And the white strings of the tzitzit, they save us from the Yetzir Hara. There are lots of stories in the Gemara. Rabbi Nachman now says, people right away, right away, the stories in the Gemara, for example, a young Torah scholar, and he went to a brothel. Excuse me, if, I wouldn't, if it wasn't in the Gemara, I couldn't tell it. Uh, he went to a brothel, and he was about to do something that the Torah doesn't exactly shine light on, not, not exactly proud of. He's not going to get to it. And when he went in there, the strings of his tzitzit, there, let's take a live example. Here are the strings of his tzitzit. They stood up. 
They stood up like hands and they said, no, 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 no. And, and he saw this. Oh, he said, better get out of there. That with the strings of the tzitzit, they saved him from sitting. And this is what Rabbi Baba Khan is referring to and what Rabbi Nachman is interpreting. This is the secret of what Rabbi Baba Khan is saying, that we don't have to, that, 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 that there's a way to turn those scorpions and to turn their momentum, that maybe they're looking over us, they want to knock us down, we knock them down. Like we knock them down, we take their part. So that, he says that the, the white mules, the chamre chivalta, chamre, it means, it, it donkeys, it also means material, the white materials, the white material is its seat. Okay, and that what protects us against immorality. So what's the significance of the white? According to the Torah, there are on every one, every side of the tzitzit, there are seven white strings and one blue string, or some people do six and, and two blue. This is a time of Torah. Why do we not have blue today? In ancient Israel, there was a dye made out of a snail that once in 70 years would come on the northern coast, which is today near Naria. It was a tribe of Zvulun, the seafaring tribe. They had that. And they would take this snail and boil it down, get this blue dye, and this would be the tchelet. This was the dye of the tzitzit. So now there's one company that claims they have it. A lot of people don't hold by that. Uh, since I'm not sure if it's the real deal, uh, most of us will see them. Most, the vast majority of us uh, just wear white. Just wear white because white is always good. And it's better than having the wrong type of blue. So we don't even use blue strings. So here he says like this. He says like this. So he says we have a double play on words with the the chama chivra. Chama means material, also means white, and uh, excuse me, it means material. And chivra, that the white donkeys mean the white material, which is the white material that sits us. So Rebbe Meir in the Gemara in Tractate Menacha, he says, uh, not having white threads on your tzitzit is a greater punishment than not having the blue threads. And he gives an example. He says, what about a king that uh, told you that uh, he made, king goes to an artisan and make me a seal, a, a seal, a signet ring. Make a signet ring. And uh he goes to a goldsmith and goes to a potter. So the goldsmith is supposed to make it out of gold. And the potter is going to make it out of clay. Okay, so there's a much greater punishment if the potter doesn't make the thing, because the, the clay is much more, uh, much more available than the gold is. Maybe there's a shortage in gold or something like that. If the, the goldsmith says, uh, your majesty, I didn't have your, your ring ready, there's a shortage of gold, that's less punishment than the potter because there's clay everywhere you go. You have to go out in the backyard and dig up the clay. Okay, so that is, what's the allusion to? That's another Gabor metaphor that we're not going to be punished by not having the blue on our tzitzit, especially we don't know which exactly which is the right color blue and whether it's an authentic dye or not authentic dye. There's, they say they get blue from a fish and it's like blue with a scale and some people hold by it, not people hold by it. There is no argument about white. So therefore, we have the simple white tzitzit and that's what, uh, 98%, 98% of the, the men in uh, that, that observe the tzitzit, they go with the plain white tzitzit. Okay, and then there are a few, uh, a few groups, some breast of some breast of Hasidim go with the blue, and uh, even the Rabbi Natan, Rabbi Natan did not go with blue. Rabbi Natan went with white also. Okay, and the, the Rizziner Hasidim, they also, they're from Polish Hasidim, they also uh, wore blue, some, some still do, but 98% of the people were white. Okay, so now that is what you're talking about. And this is the correction of the scorpions. When you take the scorpion, you turn it to the white mule, and the white mule is an illusion for the tzitzit, and the tzitzit protects us against the Scorpio that he doesn't, but this is the, the evil inclination, and that he doesn't uh, ruin the advice of the tzaddik. Now, maybe some people that were born in November or in the Hebrew month of Cheshvan, they might insult it. Wait a second, what's it, a Scorpio? I'm the evil inclination. No, you have to understand one thing. Uh, if you're a Scorpio, 
we all have an active evil inclination. Okay, but a Scorpio has a bigger chance to fall into the trap of evil inclination. And a Scorpio, when he or she overcomes evil inclination, gets much bigger reward. It's like the Scorpio is fighting in special forces. Okay, that's the secret here in Scorpio. So if you're a Scorpio, be happy because you've been chosen for special forces to, to fight against that. And the, the biggest reward is when someone has a natural quality. We all have this nature, this is the animal qualities. Okay, when we overcome our animal qualities, then that's it. So the, uh, the Scorpio has got animal quality. Scorpio, he's dangerous. If you see it, a Scorpio, if, if Scorpio... That below the stars. By the way, a Muna breaks up above the stars. Once a person hikes into a Muna, doesn't matter whether you're Taurus or Pisces or Sagittarius, it doesn't matter. You're above the stars. And this is what Hashem told Abraham. Abraham was a master scientist, a master uh, astrologist. Abraham looked up the stars and he said to Hashem, Hashem, I'm never going to have kids. Hashem says, get out of your astrology. I need your astrology. So he took Abram's name. He said, Abram won't have kids. And he put a letter of Hashem's name, a hey, and made it Abram, Abraham. Abraham will have kids. His wife, Sari, he took one letter away from her, head, put that also letter of hey in her head. Sari won't have kids, but Sarah, she will have kids. Okay, so we go above stars. That's where the miracles are. Miracles not below the stars, they're above the stars. And Muna is not below the stars. And Muna and logic have nothing to do with one another. Somebody says, so that's not logical. Of course it's not logical. It's a Muna. It's a Muna. Muna says divine law. It's divine logic. We don't understand divine logic, but divine logic is supernatural. Divine logic overrides nature. So maybe a doctor will say there's no cure. That's the doctor. He's below the stars. According to Muna, now we uplift a person. Muna, in a Muna, above a Muna, there is stars. Maybe somebody says, okay, oh, you're never going to find a soulmate with your predicament, this and that. That's below the stars. Oh, look at the horoscope. Your horoscope says you never get, get out of the horoscope. Hold it to Muna. Heck, Muna. If you hold it to Muna, you're going to find your soulmate next week. Bezat Hashem. Amen. This is with everything, with everything in the world, with everything. So this is what Rebbe Dachman is teaching us. So if you're Scorpio, Okay, don't be insulted. Don't be upset. Be happy because uh, you've got your like the, the, your your Scorpio. It's like a your special ops tag right right here, a special ops badge, and you have a greater chance. Yes, a great challenge, great challenge. It's hard to overcome. For example, a Scorpio would has been insulted. Why is he called a Scorpio? Stings like like, like a scorpion. Uh, they, he won't let. They can't. It's difficult for him to let it go. But if he learns or she learns that Amuna, then you get it go. And this goes on. We could, could go and could take the whole uh, zodiac and talk about each one of the mazalot. That's the mazal in Hebrew. It doesn't mean luck. Mazal means your 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 star on zodiac. Okay, but each one of the mazals, that's your monthly, the, the month you were born in, that corresponds to one of the, the, the constellations of the zodiac. And like the Scorpio is Cheshvan, that's the month after Tishrei. Okay, and, and this it's to overcome. And this is another thing that Rebbe Nachman is alluding to uh, by the, 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 the Scorpion. There's so good, deep and deep layers and layers and layers, like you're peeling on you another layer, another layer, another layer. You take the more you go into Rebbe Nachman's teachings, the more secrets you go. So, what is this heavenly voice that, that they heard? Woe to me that I took an oath. So, the Rashbam, okay, the Rashbam was, uh, this was Rashi's grandson, one of the Bali Tosfo. The Rashbam explains that this was God's oath that he said. And this was concerning the exile. Okay, now this is uh, Hashem. Hashem had remorse. These people are in exile. Okay, really says, how can Hashem have remorse? Hashem knows exactly what he's doing. It's like you have remorse when your child was a little bit uh, cheeky, and you had to give what we call in Yiddish a patch, a little spat to the child, a little reminder that he's been too cheeky. And then the parent, the parent has more pain than the child. The child cries because he's insulted, but the parent has more pain. But the dad to know you gave the child that patch because that's what he needed for to educate him. If you didn't give him that little patch, that little reminder, then he would go and become spoiled child. Then that's what King Solomon says. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, Jared. My that's the, the old time. Yeah, the Russian patch. Yeah. <laughs> Bo Hashem. There you go. Okay. Tell your son to look out. Okay. Uh, 
and, and this is a Hashem had to give us this patch, otherwise we'd have been gone as a people. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid. So by sending us into exile amongst these hostile nations, we had to stick together, we had to make sure and come back to Hashem. But now this is the good news. So Rabbi Barbachana is telling us, Rabbi Nachman is interpreting that since he saw, since he merited seeing Mount Sinai, he's such a tzaddik that Hashem let him see Mount Sinai, that Hashem let him see the spiritual war going around. What he saw was not physical. He didn't see physical scorpions surrounding 613 physical scorpions the size of white mules. He saw that this light side and dark side angels disguised, and it, it, this was a, a vision, a prophecy. And this was Shem let him see. So since he was on the level, Rabbi Barbara Hanna, we could see this prophecy. Hashem let him hear a heavenly voice. And the heavenly voice was the heavenly loving father saying, I'm sorry I gave my, my kindalach, I'm sorry I gave my children a patch. Okay? But now, here's the way to correct it. Connect to the tzaddik. I said you the tzaddik. The tzaddik will take you to truth. Truth will take you to Emuna. Emuna will take you to Geula. Boom, I bring you all home. I give Mashiach, build the Beit HaMikdash. The heavenly temple is already built. That it right corresponds to this heavenly Jerusalem. And right where the Temple Mount is down here, that's the Temple Mount corresponds directly above. That's why that all the prayers ascend from the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Okay, so now we, we uh, arrive at uh, section Vav, the sixth section, and Rabbi Nachman explains to us, this is the interpretation of the original verse. And look at this, this is, I didn't plan it this way, but this is from Shemayim. The original verse that Torah 7 start out with was Ela Mishpatim. It's this week's Torah portion. That's the first sentence in this week's Torah portion. And here we are right before Shabbat, the Torah portion. Here we're learning the, the it really inside interpretation. Okay, Ela. So every place that it says the Ela, Ela means and these. Okay, it means it's something to adding something. So Ela Mishpatim, the Mishpatim of the laws. These are laws. Why does the Torah say and these are the laws? The Ela Mishpatim. This is the beginning of this week's Torah portion. Rabbi Nachman says that this is adding Yosef. Yosef was the absolute tzaddik. Yosef was the first one to come to Egypt. He prepared Egypt so that his father and his brothers and the children of Israel could remain in holiness because Egypt was the most, worst place for debauchery on the, on the earth. Egypt was like a, a, a one, I don't even want to say what it was. You can't, it was difficult for Moses to find a place to pray in Egypt, because there was so much debauchery and so much idolatry, and he had to find some place where he wasn't an eye shot or ear shot of idolatry and debauchery. And it, it was it was it, it was a, a spiritual cesspool. But by Joseph going to Egypt, and Joseph withstood the test of debauchery when he was tempted by the most beautiful woman on earth, that was Potiphar's wife then. And Joseph, the, 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 the Midrash tells out how he had to straight himself. He risked breaking two legs to escape, or he jumped out of a second-story window. Okay, and then, then she she made it, she framed him, and she said, here he is, this is, he tried to do something to him, and then they threw him in a jail for 13 years, and he came out of the jail and became the viceroy. And in jail, this is all Hashem's plan, because while he was in jail, he, he solved the dreams of, uh, of, of Pharaoh's bartender and Pharaoh's... Uh, Pharaoh's uh, baker, that the baker would get hung and the bartender would be uh, resumed to his former station. Highness, and this is the joke. Okay, but what Rabbi Nachman tells us, Joseph observed the whole Torah. Even before Torah was given on Mount Sinai, Joseph wore tzitzis. And on the cloak of many colors that he got from his father, they had special, they were tzitzis. This protected Joseph. He had this protection of the fringes that Jacob knew, it, he, Jacob was also a prophet. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were prophets. He knew J Joseph would need extra protection. Joseph was his, not his son, his prime student. The brothers were jealous of Joseph. Okay, and this would need them. Okay, so what this corresponds to what we spoke about 
the holy seed, Zera Emet. But this is the holy seed. Jacob, his seed is holy. Uh, Jacob, the Rashi tells us, Jacob became a father at uh, 86. And until he became a father, he never never spilled one seed outside the context of a mitzvah. This is the first seed. And that's why he calls Reuven. Reuven, his name is first son. He says, Reshit Oni, this is my first power. This is the, the power. This is the, the first time. This was the, this was the purity and the holiness of our forefathers. Okay, so these are the laws. That what is what the laws that what did, why does the Torah mean? The, the laws that look for you. Okay, these are the laws that come from Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the tzaddik. Okay, they come before you, before you in Hebrew, to play on words with truth. Emet, that this is right before you. As you can see, for your eyes, you read the truth. So the, the Rabbi Nachman says, this is the first cycle where the tzaddik brings us to truth. And then the, we continue on with uh, Likutei Moran, and he says, Ah, this, why did we learn in the beginning that we said something very cryptic? We said we'd learn it in the last lesson. But in the very first lesson, go back to the first lesson, the Rabbi Nachman says, man and women are equal. Like man equals woman, woman equals man. And he said the same thing now on the dark side where the the dark side male and the dark side female, dark side male, the snake, and dark side female, the scorpion. And he says, what's Rabbi Nachman talking about? Uh -huh. Now Rabbi Nachman says, now I'm going to explain to you what I talked about, why I said, this is answer to all the women's liberation. They want to say that Judaism is chauvinistic, the Torah is chauvinistic. Rabbi Nachman tell you men and women are equal. Okay, they just have different jobs. That doesn't mean they're equal. And you can say it's like saying a bricklayer and a carpenter are equal. What does it mean that they're equal? Nobody's better than the other one. It's just a bricklayer needs a carpenter, a carpenter needs a bricklayer, and they both need a plumber, and all three of them need an electrician. Otherwise, you're not going to build a building. All right. so it's, and they're, they're all equal. Rabbi Nachman says a man and a woman, they are equal. So what is he referring to? That He's referring to the aspect of man and woman where man is emet, man is truth, and woman is emunah. In the female word, the woman is emunah. And this is so deep. Uh, before the war, and I used to go, you know, did for years, I've been going all around the world and, and speak emunah wherever I go. And the same thing, whether it's in Los Angeles, in Miami, in London, in Manchester, in Singapore, in mainland China, wherever I go, there's always, maybe less than two women to one man. Women are so much more hungry for emunah. Women are more seek of emunah. It, it, it's amazing. Never understood why till I learned Torah seven, because th this is this is the ancient scholar Rabbi Nachman says the woman is aspect of emunah, and the man is aspect of truth. And I understand why there's lots of 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 shalom bayit marital problems. Because a man says to a wife, he says, you're lying to me. No, she's she's speaking according to her, not to her logic. And she's speaking to what she feels like. This to her is reality. But it's not the same reality the man sees. The man, he's he's Emmet. If he's a proper man, he's Emmet. So we, Rabbi Nachman says that the aspect of the male is the Emmet, the truth. And the aspect of the female is Emunah. But no, they're not separate. They come together, they're one entity, they're joined, that's why they get married, so that you have a marriage of truth and emunah, and you get that when they're connected to the tzaddik. The tzaddik takes you to truth, truth takes you to emunah. Now that you're connected, truth and emunah, wow, you know what they get? Truth and emunah, they give birth to the for redemption of the people, the gula. That's it. You connect truth, you have the tzaddik, the tzaddik's like the shatrin. He connects the emet and the amuna. The emet and the amuna, they come together in a marriage. And now this gives birth to Mashiach. Now you can understand why we say birth pangs of Mashiach. Hame Mashiach. Just like in, we, we, we say birth pangs in labor. Right? In labor. Because in this is what's going on right now. 
everything that's going on in Israel, everything that's going on in the United States, everything that's going on in Ukraine and Russia, everything that's going on in the world, these are all birth pangs of Mashiach. And it's all in the Gemara. And the reason people say, aren't you scared? What's going on? And this and that. It's going to be a World War III, especially what's going on in Israel. And that with the Houthis and the Red Sea and all our borders are crazy. I mean, uh-uh. Because it, a couple of years ago, if I picked up the Gemara and learned that the Galilee, the Galilee villages, they would be deserted. What are you talking about? A strong border. And the southern villages, the Gaza area villages, they would be deserted. This is right before Mashiach. This would happen. Who could predict something like this? And this is exactly what's happening. We've got uh, tens of thousands. I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but people that have had to leave because the war zone in the south, they've had to leave their house in the north because of the war zone in the north, and it's unsafe to be there. Hezbollah is firing all the time in the north. And, and so in Gaza, who knows what's going to be in there in the South with all the time with uh, Blinken and the Americans make a ceasefire. And every time not come us down, the Americans pick them back up. And then to, to today, there was a rocket fire in the, in, the, in the South for the first time after four days. OK, because they regrouped themselves with this humanitarian aid that goes it's humanitarian. It's Hamas aid. OK, but I don't go to politics. But you can see this is exactly well, you can see I'm not upset about this because our sages warn who are sages? That Sadiqim, that Sadiqim, that they see this truth. That's why you, it's a waste of time to listen to the news. It's a waste of time to listen to newscasters. They don't have a Muna. They're not getting their information from Sadiqim. It's not from Torah. They don't know what they're talking about. What they say in the morning, first of all, if you want to hear that, okay, turn on channel 13 and they'll tell you one thing. Then turn on channel 12, you're the exact opposite. Uh, and it, it, yeah, channel Channel Eleven says that there's about to be a a, a settlement with the uh, with, with with Hamas and give back the prisoners. And 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 and, and, and then Channel Ten says no way that just it's, it's, it's cut off. You hear? It? Don't need to bother. Don't waste a single time. What you're doing? Learning the news, learning truth. I'm going to tell you one thing. Our group right here in Liquid Tamer Run, you're in the right place. Okay, if you're involved. Rabbi Nachman, you're in the right place because you're now connected to the wisdom of the tzaddik. We're giving up the wisdom of the tzaddik, and that's taking you to truth. Okay, so now we can understand what Rabbi Nachman says. So wait a second, we talked about what Rabbi Nachman said in the beginning. We talked about, wait, why did Rabbi Nachman talk about that the students to learn and didn't understand? Okay, and that means that you have to Put like a, a spread table. Our code of Jewish law is called Shulchan Aruch, like a set table. It's a set table. Everything has to be set before you. Here is the cups, and here's the saucers, and here's the plates, and here's the salad plates, and here's the forks, and here are the knives. That this is the laws of Shabbat, and these are laws of business, and these are laws of kashrut, and these are laws between man and fellow man, these are laws of marriage, and these are laws of burial, and that to be right, right before. Okay, so this is what the scriptures say, and how do you do that? That with wisdom, when it comes down unadulterated by way of the tzaddikim in our direct train, in our direct chain back to Moses, then it is like a set table. It's beautiful. And this is the whole, whole thing. Okay, so now we're up to letter seven, Ot Zion. Rabbi Nachman is now what we call in, in, in French literature the denouement. The denouement at the end of the novel, everything is wrapped together. So we've been learning for three weeks now, three and a half weeks. And Rabbi Nachman is wrapping it all to make everything understandable. Okay, so he says, Now prayer. Prayer is now in the land of Emuna. That is a land of miracles. And now we're above the stars. Okay, so if you're down on your thing, my scoroscope is not good. I'm a Scorpio. Uh-uh, not anymore. As soon as you start praying, you uplift yourself above the stars. And Rabbi Nachman says, Bishvazat fila mesugal zikaron, kat filat prinat emuna. He says, for this prayer, if a person is forgetful, you have a little problem with amnesia, you can't remember, remember things, to start praying. Rabbi Nachman says, pray, prayer is good for the memory because prayer is the exact aspect of emuna. Okay. When you have one of emunas, emuna herself, she has a different name and it's fila, it's prayer. And when I'm in prayer, are two twin sisters. Maybe they're 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 identical twins. They're, they're identical twins. They're 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 twin sisters. That uh, they this is good because they're on the same level. 
Prayer is above nature. Oh, and my twin sister, Amuna, she's above nature. We're right there together. Imagine it's another indication, another Gemini. Gemini, the twins, they're, they're twins connected. This is everything. Rabbi Nachman can, so deep, could take, really could learn Torah. I know uh, there, are, there are scholars in Likate Moran, they would take a year to learn this Torah. It's, it's so deep, it's so deep. Uh, so we just wrote, okay. Uh, so Rabbi Nachman says, Rabbi Nachman says, now the horoscope, the horoscope is day after day. And people look in the New York Times or uh, the, the London Gazette or wherever it's called, and they look at their, their daily horoscope. Rabbi Nachman says, that's below the stars. That's not for Amunah people, above the stars. Abram won't have kids. Abraham will have kids. We'll have kids. So Rabbi Nachman says, get out of there. And now he goes on something that's something very, very wonderful. And he mentions something we talked about. I mean, that's good for your memory. Rabbi Nachman says, Mem that when Hashem carved the Ten Commandments, and he carved the fire, at the second commandment, after the first tablets were broken, Moses chiseled them out according to what Hashem did. Okay, but the first were made by Hashem. Now, in the first tablets, the end mem, the final mem, and the samach, they were a miracle. Why? Because they're round. It's called. There was nothing to connect them to the stone. So had they, they stood, the, the samach and the mem were a miracle. So samach and mem are a hundred. Okay. So we say that ma, ma men, which is 40, and samach, which is 60, that comes out to 100. 100, up till 100, the dark side below the stars of amnesia can control up to 100. And now Rabbi Nachman is giving us a secret that the Gemara says, when you want to remember something, learn it 101 times, because as soon as you learn something 101 times, you have gone past nature. Okay, nature, that forgetfulness is, learns a hundred times, but as soon as a person learns 101 times, they're above, they're above and beyond, they're beyond the stars. Okay, so that's why the Gemara says, Rabbi Nachman said, by the way, this is the secret, he's throwing things in that fire. And okay, that if you learn a page of Gemara 101 times, it's not like learning a hundred times. That under it makes it so much more special. Nobody understands that. And that's why Rabbi Nachman talks. Rabbi Nachman says there's a special dark side angel that's in charge of forgetfulness. And that's a learning thing up a hundred times. I'll probably guarantee you that if you talk to a gymnastic coach, and if that gymnastic coach, if I take the, the head of the Russian gymnastic coach, that they're perennial champions, and say, how many times a gymnast has to practice that? He'll say more than a hundred times. Because if we do some type of a double back flip with a with a twist that this is what, on a floor exercise. It's crazy. Okay, you can't do this kind of way. practice over and over and over and over. But after I'm sure with that gymnast, as soon as she gets it right 101 times, that's it. That's second nature. That's right. It's a big difference between 100 and 101. Okay, now Rabbi Nachman continues on and he says you should know that the tzitzis da kitzitzit shmira leneuf what he alluded to before, that tzitzit, what we talked about today, it protects against immorality. And this was uh, alluded to by the skirt. We said when Ham, Shem, Ham, and Yefet, when Ham uh, molested his father, his father was lying in bed and sleep. He drank too much wine. And one Midrash says that he castrated his father because he didn't want his father to have more kids that he would have to split the inheritance with. And another Midrash says that he considered it, he could he sodomized his father, that are both terrible breaches of holiness, that the terrible immorality, and that Shem and Ham, they came in with a fringe garment to cover the father. And this fringe garment, which are again alludes to our tzitzis, which is a fringe garment. That this is a protection against immorality, debauchery, everything else is protects a person against immorality. And now we can understand what Rabbi Nachman says. 
ועל זה פירוש ונוכל נתתי לו סורק, כי הוא מקובל טיפי השכל, על ידי הצדק, עץ אשר מקבל ממנו. Now we understand how important it is to take the advice of a tzaddik, because when we get the advice of a tzaddik, we get little drops of his brain, his brain, his holy brain, and we interpret that, we imbibe that. The tzaddik's brain becomes part of our brain. When I internalize the advice of the tzaddik, the tzaddik's brain, the tzaddik's brain is from my brain. And that's why one of our big jobs in, in understudy when a person is connected to a tzaddik is to put aside our own agendas and just what, what, what the Rebbe says, what the Rebbe teaches us, okay? And this is, uh, this is, talks about that what, what happens, Rebbe Nava talks, I don't know if any gynecologist could explain that. Excuse me, uh, doctor, explain to me what happens to the male seed before conception. I don't know if the doctor said, well, it begins in the brain. It begins in the brain, and then it goes down the white material, the backbone, and goes into, gets a, cooked in the kidneys and then gets transferred to where it needs to be transferred. And that's why Rabbi Nachman explains to us that we get peace of an intellect. Where do we learn that from? The Gemara says how important it is for a couple's thoughts to be during conception because that influences, influences his seed, influences her egg. If they think of holy things, then their kids are going to be holy. Their kids are going to be beautiful. And if they think of lewd things, then there's going to be all kinds of problems with the kids. Uh, cheekiness and chutzpah, and misbehaved, all types of all types of problems. So this is conceptually exactly what's happening. Rabbi Nachman explains the, this whole thing against uh, Mr. Scientist. Rabbi Nachman is throwing science and mathematics and right and left. They're just rolling off his sleeve because this is all divine knowledge. And what Rabbi Nachman and the Baal Shem Tov and the Arizal and Rabbi Shem Boyachai and what Moses forgot that the college professors don't yet know. Not only that, the NASA people don't yet know. Okay. So now Rabbi Nachman saying, okay, this is, uh, by the way, Rabbi Nachman begins to talk about the brain. There was a famous sage that lived to about 60 years ago. I think the Chazanish passed away 60 years ago. Okay. Um, the Chazan Ish, Rabbi Ashishal Karelitz, and from Bnei Brak, and he was the brilliant scholar of the time, not too long ago, not so long ago. He lived about 60 years ago. And uh, once a brain surgeon was baffled, didn't know how to do the surgery, that if he didn't do the surgery, the patient would die. And if he did do the surgery, he thought as soon as he laid the scalpel on the individual cerebrum that he did, that was very difficult. And he went to see the Chazanish. Uh, there was a religious doctor, uh, another religious uh, neurosurgeon in Tel Shomer Hospital that said to the secular doctor, listen, we have a, a very wise rabbi in Bnei Brak, go see him, Chazanish. Okay, the Chazanish, by the way, Rabbi Wolby's grandfather, uh, and, and the Chazanish, they were also very good friends. And rabbi Wolby's grandfather was a, a tremendous big tzaddik too. Uh, Alei Shur, the Rabbi Shlomo Wolby. Okay, there's a, all of a blessed memory. So you should know who our host is. Let's tell you who our host is. is very, very special. Uh, tzaddik, son after son. So he went to, he went to Bnei Brak and he said, Rebbe, what, what's the problem? And, and he says, I don't know how to do it. He, he says, the Rebbe asked him what the problem is. He says, I don't know how to do this particular uh, neurosurgery. He said, explain to me. He says, but explain to him. I'm going to explain to you the parts of the brain. Yes, explain to me. So they explained to him and the Hazanish took out a piece of paper and he drew a map of the brain. He drew where he should make an incision, how she would go in to that particular part of the brain. And the surgeon was dumbfounded. He never thought of that. And he said, Rebbe, where did you learn medicine? He said, no, this is Gomorrah Tractate, Hulin. Uh, it's all another, another tzaddik, tremendous tzaddik that never opened up a secular book in his life. So Rebbe Nachman talks about the three parts of the brain. And this is... Uh, he alludes to where he says that you learn that from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. And this is connected to Chochma, Bina, and Dot, that uh, Chochma, wisdom, and Bina, understanding, and Dot, knowledge. And these three parts of the brain, and these three parts of the brain, that when a person 
connects in self or herself to the wisdom of the tzaddik, that they get the tzaddik's brain on all three parts and their brain becomes fertile and they therefore plant fertile fruit. So their brain becomes, what does it mean that your brain becomes fertile? That your ideas bear fruit, that your ideas, you're productive. They said part about productive. That's the same, same thing about a, a, tr- a fruit tree, that it's productive. Okay, now we go to the final interpretation of Rabbi Barbachana. Rabbi Barbachana says, and this is what talking about that the merchant told me. And Rashi says, Rashi says that whenever, whenever Rabbi Barbachana talks about a Bedouin merchant, he's talking about uh, a merchant, he's talking about a, a, an Ismailite uh, soicher. A soicher is like a, a peddler, and peddler goes round and round and round and round. This is, uh, Rabbi Nachman says, this is an indication of prayer because prayer goes round and round and encircles a person's soul and encircles a person's world and, and, and goes right up. So this is a, a, a person, when uh, when a person's prayer is heard, that Hashem takes it in entirety. Okay, so Rabbi Barachana says that when the merchant said to me, the merchant is telling me that uh why do you say why he's talking about an Ishmaelite merchant? Ishmael in Hebrew, Ishmael means Hashem will hear my prayer. So just by the name of an Ishmaelite merchant, that means that Hashem is going to accept your prayers. Why is Hashem going to accept prayers? Because you've been connected to the tzaddik, you're connected to truth, you've now earned a muna. Now you know not a muna, you believe in Hashem. You believe in Hashem, you believe in prayer, because the muna and prayer are the same aspect. So now with a muna, your prayers become above nature. Nothing in nature limits you. That doesn't care what the doctors say, what the lawyers say. It doesn't matter, no hope. <laughs> below the stars, there might be no hope. In the horoscope, there's no hope. But both, you're in a ship's hands. A ship could do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. So when somebody thinks, instead of being depressed or uh, in a hopeless situation, it's time to strengthen the moon, time to strengthen prayer. And this is what Ruth said in the third chapter. And I went, Ruth, she came to Boaz. Ruth, this is an allegory. Okay, Ruth, she wasn't Jewish, okay, but she came to the Jewish people because you know they had the truth. She came to the tzaddik, was Boaz, and she said, uh, my master, okay, she ended up marrying him. She converted, she married him, and she said, you spread your garment over me. What's his garment? And then his garment, the same thing as, as Shem and, and, and uh, Shem and Yefet, the garment, the fringe garment. You spend the fringe garment, the fringe garment that sits in. In other words, you have spread your wisdom of the 613 pieces of advice and the 613 pieces of Torah. You spread it over your handmaid. And when she covered herself in this, this is what this was where she made her full conversion. Okay. And this is what Haggai and Navi also talks about this in chapter two of the Navi Haggai. Haini Saish Basal Koidish. He refutes to this, and he also says that in uh, a person goes to the Holy Temple, and when you do a ritual sacrifice, a gift offering, like on the holiday, and a gift offering, a person is allowed to eat of the gift offering. There are certain offerings that only the high priest or the priests are allowed to eat. When you make this gift offering, you take the meat, and you take it, you have to be cooked in Jerusalem, okay? And what do you do it? You wrap it in a fringed garment, because the fringed garment keeps it from being adulterated. It preserves the holiness of the holy temple. And then you imbibe this holiness, not because I want to eat steak or want to eat lamb chops, but I want to eat the holiness of a sacrifice. This was a sacrificial offering to Hashem. Okay, and this is this we have here. So now Rabbi Nachman completes uh, Torah 7, and he says that there is a special remedy for a sick person if someone is sick. And they don't know the better than find somebody with tzitzis, and a sick person should look at tzitzis. By looking at tzitzis, imbibes the holiness, and by imbibing the holiness, this chases the dark side out. And this is, uh, with that, Rabbi Nachman completes Torah 7. Bezrat Hashem, next week, we're going to start a brand new Torah, and uh, we have to pray to Hashem, get to the right Torah for the right time, and this is all, everything we do is pray. There's not a single lesson we say that we don't pray ahead of time, all week long.
all week long. That I can guarantee you. I don't know what the, the quality of lesson is, but there's a lot of prayer goes behind that. So with Hashem's loving grace, everyone should have a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Emuna Hour. Uh, this lesson was a long one. Take it over. Take everybody a lovely, big blessing for the whole group. And Rabbi Wolby, everything wonderful for the Torch, Torch organization and the Wolby family. And let's hear good news from each other.